Okay, let's unpack this. Imagine a robot built with like 206 bones and a thousand artificial muscles moving almost like us, mm -hmm. but it has no face. <laughs> Sounds like something straight out of sci-fi, right? Total. Well, uh, this is real. It's the Protoclone and welcome to Dance Plane, where we dive deep into the fascinating and sometimes, well, mind-bending stuff out there. Yeah, welcome back. Today we're plunging into the world of this new humanoid robot from a Polish startup called Clone Robotics. Exactly. And this isn't your typical, you know, clunky robot arm we see in factories. Clone Robotics is really focused on something called biomimicry. Biomimicry. Yeah. So copying biology. Pretty much. Designing things by copying how nature actually works. So our goal today, our mission for this deep dive is to really understand what makes this protoclone so different. Okay, right. Like, what are they trying to do with this design? How does it even work? And what are the bigger implications, you know? Mm. A robot that looks and moves this much like a human. Okay, so let's start with the big why. Why go to all the trouble making it so human-like? And the answer seems to be that core idea you mentioned, biomimicry. Mm -hmm. Instead of using, you know, standard rigid robot parts, they're aiming to replicate our actual anatomy, how our bodies function. Yeah, and here's where it gets really interesting. They're using these soft, water-powered, artificial muscles. They call them myofibers. Myofibers, water power. Yeah, to get that really fluid kind of natural movement. It's a completely different path than most other humanoid robots are taking. Totally different. Because you think about, say, Tesla's Optimus or Unity's G1. Right. Their design priorities are just elsewhere. Uh -huh. Optimus seems geared towards practical factory <laughs> tasks, right? Specific, repeatable motions. Functional. Exactly. And Unity's G1 is more about agility, maybe trying to bring the cost down, make them more accessible. They have different degrees okay. of freedom. That's basically how many ways the joints can move. Okay. Their main goals are just different. What's really wild about Protoclone is this like extreme focus on copying biology. Yeah. And when you say copying, they really mean it. We're talking a full skeleton, 206 bones, just like us. Incredible, isn't it? plus detailed joints that move like ours, even artificial ligaments and connective tissues. I mean, the level of detail is kind of nuts. It really is. And that anatomical accuracy lets it have this amazing range of motion. The protoclone apparently has over 200 degrees of freedom. 200? Okay, put that in perspective for me. Like, compared to a typical robot? Well, a standard industrial robot arm might have, what, maybe six degrees of freedom? Something like that? Six versus 200. Yeah, it's a massive difference. And that's what could theoretically let the protoclone handle objects with a dexterity we just haven't seen in robots before. Think about tasks needing really fine motor skills. Like all the tiny adjustments your hand makes without you even thinking about it. Exactly that kind of thing. That's what that high DOF aims for. And those 1,000 myofiber muscles, they're not just stuck on anywhere, are they? No, no. They're attached at very specific points on those artificial bones, basically mirroring how our own muscles connect to make us move. It's all about achieving that natural, almost animal-like fluidity. So the myofibers are the actuators, the things actually making it move. Uh -huh. And using water is, yeah, pretty novel. Very novel. And it's not just about movement. It's also about how it senses the world. The protoclone is packed with sensors 500 in total. 500? That's a lot of input. It's huge. They're clearly trying to give it a really deep understanding of itself and its environment. Okay, so break that down. What kind of sensors are we talking about? Well, you've got four deaf cameras for vision makes sense, right? For seeing and navigating. Standard enough. Yeah. But then, get this, 70 inertial sensors. Ah. These are for joint level proprioception. Proprioception. That's like knowing where your limbs are without looking, like touching your nose with your eyes closed. Precisely. That sense is absolutely crucial for coordinated movement. And then it has 320 pressure sensors just for muscle force feedback. Okay, wait. So it's not just telling a muscle to move. It's feeling how hard that muscle is actually working. Exactly. Think about how you grip something fragile versus something heavy you adjust automatically. These <laughs> sensors are trying to give the robot that same kind of fine-tuned control. So all this sensory data feeds into its control, its awareness. But hang on, we haven't actually seen it walking around on its own yet, have we? That's a really important point. In the videos, it's always shown suspended, doing these movements in the air. Right. So while it has all this incredibly sophisticated sensing, the actual autonomous walking part, mm -hmm. well, that seems less clear for the current prototype. It suggests the complex coordination, the algorithms, the physical power system 
they still need more work before it's truly walking independently. Right. Which brings us to power. How does it actually move those thousand muscles? You said water powered, but how? Well, right now the prototype seems to be using a pneumatic system. So compressed air to flex those myofiber muscles. Oh, power. Okay. But the plan, the goal, is to switch to hydraulics. Hydraulics, oh. by the change, more power. Generally, yeah. Hydraulics usually offer significantly more force and more precise control compared to pneumatics. That'd be pretty essential for doing heavier tasks or achieving even smoother, more realistic movements. Makes sense. And they apparently engineered this whole thing they call a vascular system. It has a 500 watt electric pump, these things called aqua jet valves. Yeah. It's this intricate setup designed to deliver the pressurized hydraulic fluid needed for those lifelike actions. A vascular system. Oh. Wow. And then there was that bit that sounded almost like pure science fiction, the sweating cooling system. Ah, yes. The article mentions that, but details are pretty thin. Like it sweats to cool down. Seriously. It sounds like they're attempting to mimic even that aspect of human biology, how we regulate our temperature. It's uh, kind of incredible if you pull it off. Really highlights how far they're pushing this biomimicry thing. It really does even down to thermal regulation. Okay, mm. so we've got the body, the senses, the power, the movement. What about the brain? How does this thing actually think? How does it process all that info from 500 sensors? So the control systems are pretty clever too. They're using microcontrollers distributed along the spine. Distributed, so not one central brain doing everything. Kind of, it makes sense when you have so many individual muscles and sensors constantly sending data back and forth, spreads the load, avoids bottlenecks. Right, like little local processing hubs feeding into the main one, yeah. and the main hub is in the skull. Exactly. There's an NVIDIA Jetson Thor GPU up there, mm. powerful bit of kit, and it's uh, running software called CyberNet. CyberNet, okay, what's that? It's described as a visual motor foundation model. Basically, think of it as the core AI that lets the protoclone understand what its cameras are seeing, and translate that into coordinated movement. It's the key to perception in that fluid motion thereafter. Got it. The brain and the software linking vision to action. Now, now let's talk about how it looks, because that's yeah. something else. Faceless, usually shown with this black sort of reflective mask, and those videos of it moving while suspended, they definitely got attention. Oh, absolutely. Striking is one word. Right. That viral video from April 2025, it made waves. Yeah. The lack of a face combined with those incredibly lifelike, almost twitchy muscle movements, yeah. it creates this really compelling, but yeah, undeniably eerie vibe. The article even used the word ghostly. Ghostly feels right. It's uncanny. It really is. And right. the public reaction reflected that, didn't it? People were amazed by the Tech 200 DOF, a thousand muscles. That's impressive stuff. For sure. But also... Also seriously creeped out. Beyond freaking creepy was one comment I saw mentioned. Yeah. People drawing parallels to sci-fi dystopias. Yeah, maybe not the PR they were hoping for entirely. It really hits that uncanny valley problem hard, doesn't it? That discomfort when something is almost human, but not quite. Definitely. It's a huge challenge if you want these things walking around in you know everyday places. Public acceptance is key. Yeah. Although, maybe there's a benefit to the human-like form for interaction. It's complicated. True. So how did clone robotics even get here? This seems incredibly complex. Did they just suddenly unveil this thing? Oh, no. This has been building for a while. Mm. They started, apparently, with just a robotic hand. Just a hand? Well, just a hand. But it was incredibly advanced even then. Artificial bones, muscles, capable of natural thumb rotation, realistic grasping. Building that alone is a major achievement. Okay, so starting small, relatively speaking. Then what? Then they moved on to a humanoid torso. Mm-hmm. Focusing on getting lifelike movement in the elbow, the neck, the cervical spine, and anthropomorphic shoulders. That must have been a huge jump in complexity. Absolutely. Building up piece by piece. Right. And then, December 2024, they officially jumped into the humanoid market with Clone Alpha, their first full-scale humanoid. Clone Alpha. Okay, I remember hearing about that. And then just a couple months later, February 2025, boom, the protoclone is unveiled. Clearly building on Alpha but taking that anatomical accuracy thing to a whole new level. Yeah. Fully bipedal, full musculoskeletal system. So this field is moving fast. You've got Optimus, Unitry G1, Figure O2. Where does Protoclone fit? What makes it stand out besides the uh, creepiness factor? Uh-huh. Well, beyond that, the key differentiator really is that extreme biomimicry, just on another level compared to the others. How so? Like we said, Optimus is more functional. G1 is about agility and cost. Even looking back at older research robots like Kangoro from Japan back in 2017, they had a musculoskeletal design too. But Protoclone seems way more advanced in motion and sensors. 
And figure 02, while showing amazing walking using AI learning, isn't focused on replicating anatomy in this much detail. So Protoclone is all in on the anatomy. What's the potential upside of that? Where do they see it being used? They talk about scalability, assisting around the house, healthcare support, maybe even helping in medical procedures. The thinking is, if it's built like us, maybe you can use our tools, navigate our spaces more easily. Interact more naturally with the human world. That seems to be the idea. Plus, they mention modular upgrades, so maybe customizing it for specific jobs. But it's not all roses, right? We mentioned the walking issue. What other big hurdles are they facing? Definitely challenges. That current pneumatic system probably limits its strength and what it can do. Hmm. Switching to hydraulics is key, but that's complex engineering. And costly, I imagine. Almost certainly. Hmm. We have zero idea about commercial timelines or pricing for Clone Alpha or Protoclone. But yeah, 1,000 muscles, 500 sensors. It sounds expensive compared to simpler designs. Yeah. And then there's the whole public acceptance thing we talked about, the uncanny valley ethical questions. It's a lot. So looking ahead, what are the next steps for Protoclone? What are they working on? The big things seem to be that hydraulics transition for more power and precision yeah. and refining cybernet, that AI brain, mm. making it smarter, more autonomous, better adapting. So better movement, better thinking. And where might we actually see these things realistically if they succeed? Healthcare keeps coming up. Delicate tasks, patient care. That seems like a strong possibility. Maybe entertainment. Super lifelike androids in theme parks and movies. Okay, I could see that. And definitely research. Study human biomechanics, movement. It could be an amazing tool for scientists. So if they can crack these challenges, the autonomy, the cost, the look, could Protoclone actually change the game in humanoid robotics? It definitely has the potential to redefine things with that biomimetic focus. Yeah. But... It's a tough market, lots of competition, different approaches, its ultimate impact, still very much up in the air. Right. So the critical takeaway here really seems to be this tension, doesn't it? You've got this groundbreaking, super detailed anatomical replication mm -hmm. versus big questions about practicality, cost, and, well, whether people want something that lifelike around. It might find a niche, like you said, maybe in specialized medical research where accuracy is everything. Exactly. Right. But for wider use, they've got hurdles. It's a very different bet than Tesla is making with Optimus, which feels much more about function over form. A completely different philosophy. Yeah. yeah. So as we wrap this deep dive on the protoclone, here's something to chew on. What does it mean if robots become more and more anatomically like us? What doors does that open? What weird challenges might pop up as that line between human and machine keeps getting blurrier? Definitely gives you pause for thought. It really does. And hey, if this dive into the protoclone got you thinking, uh, be sure to like and subscribe for more explorations into tech and beyond right here on Dansplain. Please do. You can also visit us at www.dansplain.xyz. That's D A N S P L A I N D O T X Y Z for the latest episodes, articles, info on partner products, all that good stuff. Thanks for joining us for this deep drive.